Hello, my dear doctors. So today we're going to uh, discuss a bit about the uh, PACES cardiology station. And I'm going to talk a bit about the mitral stenosis. Uh, actually, this case uh, depends uh, where you, are you taking your MRCP PACES exams. Uh, suppose if you're taking your exams in UK, uh, then it is very less likely that uh, you'll come across mitral stenosis. But if you are uh, taking your exam in international centers like in uh, Asia, uh, then sometimes uh, uh, mitral stenosis case uh, can appear in the cardiology station. So I will talk very briefly and uh, about the presentation, how should we present the case of mitral stenosis and what could be the possible questions uh, from the examiners. So uh, once you enter the station, cardiology station, and obviously going to start with the inspection, um, I'll just give you a brief uh, presentation first. Normally, I think all of us are... Uh, we know about uh, how to examine the patients, uh, like starting inspection and then moving closer and doing uh, palpation and auscultation. So uh, first thing, suppose you are in cardiology station and you see the patient there. The patient can have difficulty breathing or they could be, they could be no, no symptoms. So if the patient has a malar flush and it's something, a rash, which is, which is, very similar to the SLE rash as you can see in the picture. So if the patient has this type of uh, uh, rash, it's called mala flush. And the other thing on inspection, uh, before even touching the patient, if you can appreciate a, a left um, a thoracotomy scar, um, normally this scar will be a very small scar, it's not like the lateral thoracotomy scar. Uh, which is uh, used for do the lobectomy or pneumonectomy. So if you came across this scar and a rash, a mala flush, then you can start thinking about mitral stenosis. Then moving on, once you've done your inspection, you're going to palpate for the pulses. And most of the time, you'll have irregular, irregular pulse. And this irregular, irregular pulse is, you know, is seen in atrial fibrillation. Moving on, then you check for the apex beat, and apex beat will be ir, uh, will be tapping apex beat, and it will be non-displaced. So important thing is uh, the apex beat will not be displaced. Normally, remember that in regurgitation cases, the apex beat is usually displaced. Sometimes you may have a left parasternal heave, uh, which is means that the mitral stenosis is quite severe. And then finally, when we move on to the auscultation, uh, you will be able to appreciate loud first start sound in the mitral area. There will be opening snap, and then we have a mid-diastolic rumbling murmur. And usually it is uh, best heard with expiration in the patient left lateral position. Now remember that the mitral stenosis murmur is difficult to hear. It's not easy to hear that murmur. So let's, let's listen the uh, mitral stenosis murmur first and then we'll talk a bit more about it. So this is something you will hear when you put your stethoscope on the mitral area in the patient in the left lateral position. If you use your headphone, I think you can you can hear it very clearly. So as you can appreciate, patient has a loud first start sound. There is some kind of click called opening snap, and then we have a rumbling murmur. So once uh, you have diagnosed, you will give your diagnosis of mitral stenosis 
and then you will mention important negatives that the patient is not in heart failure because the JVP is normal, there is no sacral or ankle swelling and there are no basal crabs. So this should finish your uh, presentation and uh, by doing things you have elicited all the important positive and negative points in your presentation. After this, uh, the examiner may ask you some questions. And uh, so I have compiled all the questions which could be asked in this station. Um, once you mention the patient has a diastolic murmur, the examiner may ask what is the differential diagnosis of diastolic murmur. So you can say that there are three conditions which can have diastolic murmur, aortic regurgitation, atrial septal defect. Now atrial septal defect is a bit tricky because normally atrial septal defect itself doesn't cause any murmur, but you may hear a murmur of tricuspid regurgitation. And we have uh, a pulmonary regurgitation uh, murmur. And uh, normally the pulmonary regurgitation murmur, you know, it is heard loudest in the pulmonary area. And it will be clearer during inspiration. And all the right side murmur are uh, more louder in inspiration. And it will radiate to the left shoulder or the left clavicle region. So there are three conditions where you may have that diastolic murmur. The examiner may ask you about what are the causes of uh, uh, mitral stenosis. So remember that rheumatic fever, more than 50% is rheumatic fever. And this is the reason that we don't see uh, many uh, mitral stenosis cases if you're paying for the exam in the UK because uh, there's no rheumatic fever there. The patients are diagnosed early and treated early. Uh, while in Asian countries still uh, patients can have rheumatic fever which can end up with the complications like mitral stenosis. So the other causes include calcification, carcinoid syndrome, it can be autoimmune like in rheumatoid arthritis or and finally congenital causes. This is a very favorite question of the examiner. They ask you whether this mitral stenosis is severe or not. So if the patient has any signs of pulmonary hypertension, like loud P2, parasternal heave, any signs of right heart failure, then you can say that this is a severe mitral stenosis. And another important point in mitral stenosis, which obviously we can only learn with experience, the duration of the diastolic murmur. So remember, if the duration is longer, then it is severe mitral stenosis. The examiner may ask you, okay, uh, what are the complications of the mitral stenosis? So remember that mitral stenosis, it can cause left atrial dilatation. So once if this left atrial dilatation is there, the patient can have atrial fibrillation. Um, because of the left atrial dilatation and some pooling of blood, blood is not efficiently pumping through the narrow mitral wall. There could be mural thrombus. There could be embolization of the thrombi which can cause TIA or uh, CVA. Uh, patient can have pulmonary hypertension and this again because of the backflow from the um, uh, left atrium and uh, patient could have congestive cardiac failure due to right heart failure. Let's talk a bit about, uh, now once you have uh, ex um, presented your case of mitral stenosis, sometimes the examiner may deviate away from the original topic and may ask you about the atrial fibrillation. So I have covered the uh, questions for the atrial fibrillation as well. In. So examiner may ask you, okay, uh, you mentioned atrial fibrillation, so what are the causes of the atrial fibrillation? So remember that uh, there are many causes of atrial fibrillation it's best to divide them in groups, like uh, atrial fibrillation, the cardiac causes of atrial fibrillation include uh, ischemic heart disease, mitral wall disease, hypertension, it can happen with cardiomyopathies and myocarditis. There are infective causes of atrial fibrillation, which includes rheumatic fever, endocarditis, and pneumonias. There are endocrine causes of atrial fibrillation as well, which includes thyrotoxicosis, some of the drugs may cause atrial fibrillation. Important drugs to remember is alcohol, digoxin, and thyroxine. And remember that finally there are respiratory causes of atrial fibrillation as well, 
which includes pulmonary embolism and lung malignancies. So it's better to divide them in different systems, easy to remember the causes of atrial fibrillation. The examiner may ask you about this, the charts, VAS score, and this is a very, very favorite uh, question. If they ask you about atrial fibrillation, they will ask you about, so which patients you will uh, anticoagulate uh, in atrial fibrillation cases. So remember that just tell the examiner that I'm going to put the charts, VAS score, VASC2 score, uh, charge, charge score was used previously, but this is more efficient score. So charge was score is, uh, it got actually uh, one point for each, except for the age, more than 75, give us two points. And if the patient has any history of stroke or uh, TIA, it will give us two points. So these are the components of the charge was score. C is for congestive cardiac failure, H is for hypertension, age more than 75 years will give us two points. Diabetes mellitus, if you give one point, stroke or TIA, two points. If the patient has any vascular uh, causes or any vascular history, like patient has an MI or peripheral vascular disease, age more than 65 to 74 years will give you, you one point and sex is. Uh, if the patient is female, then it gives one point. So remember that uh, if the patient has more than one point, then the patient can be offered the uh, anticoagulant. Uh, to prevent uh, any thrombosis, emboli, which can eventually lead to TIA or uh, CVA. So next, the examiner may ask you, okay, uh, how you'll treat the patient with atrial fibrillation. So remember that there are two approaches we, we should mention uh, in case of atrial fibrillation. What is our aim of treatment? So either we could aim for rhythm control or rate control. Um, usually the rhythm control is for the younger patient if the patient age is less than 65. If the patient has a new onset atrial fibrillation, if the patient is symptomatic, or if this is secondary to treated or corrected precipitants, um, like the patient has thyrotoxicosis and you have corrected thyrotoxicosis, it's better to go for the rhythm control. Rate control usually for the patient who are more than 65 years of age, if the patient has... Um, uh, coronary heart disease, if they are unstable for, unsuitable for cardioversion, for example, if the patient has chronic atrial fibrillation, or contraindication to antiarrhythmics. Now, uh, another question the, the examiner will ask is, uh, um, normally, you know, we use the traditional anticoagulant, which is uh, vitamin K antagonists like warfarin, but there are newer or new oral anticoagulants available as well. Before this, they were called novel oral anticoagulants, but no more, they, they are novel no more, so they are called direct oral anticoagulants. Examiner may ask you, are you aware of any direct oral anticoagulants? So you must respond that. Uh, Debigatron is one of them, which inhibits thrombin synthesis, and Rivoroxaban, uh, another one which inhibits factor 10 and there are a few others also, but if you remember these two is enough. Uh, the examiner may ask you what are the advantages and disadvantages of this uh, new uh, direct oral anticoagulants. So you must mention that uh, uh, the advantage is the patient, uh, uh, once we put the patient on this direct oral anticoagulants, there is no need for regular monitoring, for regular INR for the patient. But there, there are some disadvantages also. The first disadvantage is the, the, these uh, direct oral anticoagulants cannot be used if the patient has got valvular atrial fibrillation. So the indication is for the non volvular atrial fibrillation. The second thing is uh, these new, new uh, direct oral anticoagulants don't have any antidote. So it is, will be very difficult to reverse uh, uh, the patient from this effect. Another important point is uh, direct oral anticoagulants, and they are not safe in renal failure. So one should have an AGFR measured and uh, have to adjust the dose. So you can you can check on the BNF for that one. So uh, this was all about uh, the direct oral anticoagulants. The examiner may come back to the topic of mitral stenosis and may ask you what investigations you like to do. So you start with the simple bedside investigations like uh, do the ECG. Um, now remember that once you mention the investigations in your PACES exam, Tell them why you want to do it, because the examiner want to listen 
and why you want to do the ECG. So ECG we want to do because we particularly looking for uh, left atrial enlargement which will be evident with the atrial fibrillation with the um, P, P mitral. We also want to look for atrial fibrillation as well as well as we will be looking for um, any other arrhythmias. We like to do the chest x-ray because we want to look at the left atrium size, it can be enlarged, there may be some pulmonary congestion as well. Echocardiography because we want to look at the size uh, of the mitral stenosis, as you know that less than one centimeter is quite severe, less than one, uh, one millimeter. Um, Echocardio, uh, then Doppler studies will give us some idea about the jet and finally is catheterization. Some patients we need the catheterization. Um, so let's talk about the treatment. So the treatment we can uh, divide for the mitral stenosis is better divided in three groups. So we divide conservative treatment, medical and surgical. So conservative treatment is if the patient is asymptomatic just go for the monitoring and regular follow-up with the cardiology team. Medical treatment, there are, first of all, if the patient is, has got atrial fibrillation, we should anticoagulate the patient. They, if there's complications, then that should be treated, like if the patient has got tiny heart failure, they should be treated, and sometimes endocarditis prophylaxis. And the third group is surgical treatment, and there are some indications for the surgical treatment if the patient got, got hemoptysis, if there's any pulmonary hypertension, or the patient has having recurrent emboli. And there are two options, either we go for valvotomy or wall replacement, but normally we go for the wall replacement. Briefly about the antibiotic prophylaxis, this is a bit of gray area, not for, now the NICE, the NICE has recommended as antibiotic prophylaxis, not needed for dental, GIE, or, or respect track procedures and patients should be advised about the risk and benefit of procedure and antibiotic prophylaxis. So my dear doctors that is the uh, end of the uh, presentation for the mitral stenosis. Hopefully uh, you were able to uh, learn something from my presentation and I will continue with my uh, cardiology station um, uh, presentations. And uh, thank you very much and see you next time.